want to go on with the subject of tonight, which is forgiveness and the healing of the memories. Let me suggest to you, haven't we missed a bit in not obeying Jesus in another particular? He said, Whoso giveth but a cup of cold water in my name to one of these, my brethren, that's the Jews, shall I know I fail to receive his reward? We haven't done it. We have not done it. Now, here's another thing. If you believe the prophecies of the Bible, for I tell you frankly, they confuse me a whole lot, but still, I kind of believe them anyway. <laughs> Many as I can understand. And as one I really do see again and again and again, I've got to understand it. It's plain as the nose on my face. Unless the whole Bible is false, this thing stands out. You can't miss it. And that is that before Jesus comes again, the women of Israel, the Jews, are going to turn to the Lord. All right. Do we want Jesus to come again or don't we? All right. If we want him to come again, there's a little job we better do. Now, any way that you can think of to do it, fine, okay. But I tell you the truth, I would not have the nerve to go and talk to them and say, you should be a Christian like I am. Look at me. I'm so good. I'm a Christian. <clears throat> I hate to say it, but as a matter of fact, I sometimes think they are more highly moral than we are, take it by and large. Did you see that picture fiddle on the roof? Now, aren't those good people? Heartbreakingly good, heartbreakingly good. They just didn't know Jesus. How could they know Jesus unless someone showed them the love of Jesus? Who can show them the love of Jesus, you know, if we who are supposed to be Christians can't show them the love of Jesus? Now, how can you show them the love of Jesus? I'll tell you one real handy way, and that is if you know or hear of any who are sick or in great trouble, you go pray for them. They love it! And in my limited experience, I wish I had more. I find that in general, a Jewish person can receive and accept healing about ten times better than a Gentile. Naturally, Jesus, the Lord, chose them, and not by accident. They have it. Many of them, of course, it's buried so deep between layers of callousness, and that's not their fault either. They've had to develop that to protect themselves. I couldn't blame them for that anyway. But it's wonderful how they receive it. One time a friend of mine who sits by Mrs. Moses Lieberman in the Philadelphia Orchestra, or she used to many years ago, called me up and said that Mr. Moses Lieberman, whom I never met, but he's not French gathering from his name, <laughs> and that he was suddenly taken violently ill with double pneumonia, and this was before they had these, sulfur, these drugs and things, and the doctor said that he could not live, and that she told Mrs. Lieberman about me, and Mrs. Lieberman said, would we pray? Would my friend Cora and I pray for Mr. Lieberman? So, of course, we were delighted to, and so I named an hour, and I said, at such an hour, we'll pray for him, and tell Mrs. Lieberman to go and be with him in the hospital at that time, and just sit by the bed. She called up later. She said, at that time, when we two prayed for him, the whole room was filled with a blue light, and... Mrs. Lieberman felt the power surging through her like a current of electricity, and Mr. Moses Lieberman was instantly healed. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Now, maybe some of you are thinking, but how can that be when he didn't believe in Jesus? Look, Jesus believed in him, and Jesus loved him, and Jesus was just waiting for an opportunity to pour his love into him, and all it took was for somebody who was Christian to pray for him and Ooh, the love of Jesus just poured in. And I don't know what happened to Mr. Lieberman the rest of his life, and I don't know what should happen. Quite frankly, I can't get up much excitement about trying to think of every Jew turning around and becoming an Episcopalian or a Baptist or something. What I like to think about is Jesus himself walking back into the synagogue, taking his own place with his own people, 
fitting right into his own history. That's the way I like to think of it. So I'm not urging you to go out and evangelize Jews and trying to persuade them to join your church, though if you want to, all right, God bless you. But I am urging you to pray for them. And there's another way in which you can show them the love of Christ, and it's so simple, it's ridiculous. I said to my Bible class one time in Motortown, just outside of Philadelphia, a great many Jewish people in Philadelphia, and I said, now, between now and next Sunday, here's your homework. Whenever you see a Jewish person, say in your heart, I bless you in the name of the Lord. And if you have occasion to speak to them, like buying a pair of gloves over the counter, smile. As little as them. And I heard the most wonderful stories. One of my girls said that in the bustle of, in Philadelphia, she had been uh, pushed off the sidewalk a little bit. She, she's a little bit lame, and, uh, you know, she was sort of crowded off the sidewalk, and there were two very large, dark, Jewish-looking gentlemen who went past her. And she just said in her mind, I praise you in the name of, and I bless you in the name of the Lord. And they stopped in their tracks, and they turned around, and came back and lifted her up on the sidewalk and were just perfectly lovely. But you see, she hadn't said a word out loud. Their backs were to her. They had not seen her, but they felt the prayer, the healing of the memory. This entering in of the love of Jesus now and going back through time. And this can happen uh, to quite a considerable extent right now. Now, the simplest way, in addition to just your own prayers, and it is a little hard to do this all by yourself, and the simplest way is to pray one for another. It works very much better if one person can channel this healing to another person. And the way it works is just amazing. Now, for instance, I had a school of pastoral care in Holland, and I had to work through an interpreter. There was a Dutch minister there, about 50 years old. He was in deep mental depression and had been for, I think he said, four years. And he had worked with several psychiatrists, so nothing helped at all. And when I got there, he had been living for three months in De Hazenberg, which was a Christian um, retreat center, very nice place. And he'd gone once a week to the healing service, and Pastor Pluch had laid down for him and prayed for healing and so on. Nothing worked at all. And his wife, furthermore, was threatening to divorce him because she claimed that he was no good and no comfort to her as a husband. They had five children, so he must have had his moments. But anyway. <laughs> there it was. The marriage was about to break up. And he was absolutely at the end of his rope. So I said to the interpreter, ask him whether he was happy as a little boy, because very often these depressions begin in childhood. She asked him, and the answer was no. Here's my second question. I said, ask him why. She asked him why. <laughs> and the answer was, by translation, that nothing very terrible, but his father was very stern and very strict and was a minister, but a very, oh, you know, hellfire and damnation type of minister. And every, every Sunday preached on sin and hell and whatnot. And the little boy was scared to death of it and terrified of God and terrified of his father, who was very much like God, uh, as the preacher, preacher represented, you know, as God was represented. So therefore, he was all shut up inside of himself. When he got into some little difficulties in school and with other children, I forget just what, nothing terribly important. The main thing was he, the deep wound in his own soul, his feeling that he wasn't loved and he wasn't wanted and nobody cared and so on. This, unfortunately, is more common than you might think. And so anyway, there it was. So I said to the interpreter, tell him but I'm going to put my hands on him and I'm going to pray for Jesus to come into him now and to go back through all the memories of his lifetime and find that little boy who was so lonely and felt that nobody loved him and was so terrified. And Jesus is going to comfort that boy and love him. It will be just as if Jesus would take him up in his arms and hold him and comfort him. Tell him that. Tell him he won't understand what I'm saying because I pray in English but that that's what I'll be saying. 
So she interpreted it to the minister. So I laid my hands on him and I prayed in the way I had learned through praying for Harry. I prayed for Jesus Christ to come in and go back through the years in this grown man of 45 or so and find that little boy you see and heal all of those broken-hearted and terrified and lonely memories and forgive whatever little sins went with it, but that was not the most important thing. And then go through all the years of his life, healing the memories all the way along and restoring the man that God made him to be. Now, you know, this is one of the gifts of the Spirit, not what's spoken of. I think it has been here somewhat. I suppose you call it a gift of wisdom, not human wisdom, heavenly wisdom, to be able to see with the eyes of the imagination or with the eyes of the spirit what a person can be. To see the highest potential in a person, don't you see? So, all right, that's the way I pray. And uh, then he went away. This was the last day of the conference. And he went away, and I stayed another week. And the next weekend, he and his wife came back, both of them absolutely radiant, the light just shining out of their faces. The man was restored. The real man had come back to life. All this other had dropped off like dead leaves off a tree when it grows up and doesn't need the old dead seed leaves anymore. The marriage was perfect. Now that is why Jesus died on the cross for us so that he could make this heavenly transfer, taking in our sins and sorrows, and in exchange giving us his holiness and real goodness and joy. And yet here we go. Now there's bits of this joy here, but so many places, even so many churches, you don't feel it, you know. And so many of us, even, even us, <laughs> yeah, at times go heavily burdened. Why? Why? Well, the thing is so great, we just don't dare believe it. We hardly dare believe it. And another reason is it's very hard to capture it for yourself. If there's anything in which you need a mediator, someone to pray for you, it is this. Now, that's not the only way, and I shall tell you other ways. But it is one of the most effective and the most powerful ways because you find it hard to reach into your own subconscious where the wounds are. But somebody outside of you who can become one with you in spirit through the love of Christ can much more easily find the way, don't you see? So now there is another name. Forgiveness of sins. But now I want to tell you another story illustrating, approaching the matter from the other point of view, where you come right straight out and call it the forgiveness of sins. And this story I got from a psychiatrist. He's also one of our leaders in the School of Pastoral Care. He's a Presbyterian elder and a Freudian analyst and a perfectly marvelous believer in faith and prayer. And he said, I'm going to tell you this story, Agnes, because you might want to use it sometime. So here I go. So he said there was a woman who was referred to him from the hospital, the ordinary hospital. I'm very happy that nowadays a great many doctors are recognizing that certain diseases are psychosomatic. Now, not all, take note of that, not all diseases. Some people think they all are, I don't believe it. I think, well, I know that some of them come from sheer exhaustion, working too hard in their service of the Lord. <laughs> some of them come from just a germ or something you pick up uh, but some of them, I do know, are psychosomatic. They come from something wrong inside, you see. And doctors recognize that more and more. So they sent this woman to Dr. Stringham. This woman, about once a month, would have terrible pains and cramps all through the middle. And the doctors, no matter what they did, there was nothing they did that could help her at all. And they couldn't find anything wrong. There was nothing wrong physically. So very wisely, they sent her to the psychiatrist. And in due time, why she told him about this extramarital affair that she'd had three or four years ago. Now, her husband had not known about her, which was fortunate, and never did know, which was fortunate, very fortunate. You know, things like that, you confess them to God, not to the person who would be brokenhearted if they knew. Confess to God. 
If you have a priest handy, you confess to God's priest, who keeps it under the seal of the confessional, if he's got any sense at all. <laughs> Which of you should tell? <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure that a priest who was heard to hear the confessional, taught to hear the confessional, would know this. There are some who don't quite think of it in that way. But incidentally, my dear friends, this is true, whether you, no matter who you are. I mean, if anyone tells you, one of you girls about something, some sin back in their lives and wants you to pray for it. You are sinning against God and your own soul and the other person if you ever tell anybody. Mm. So anyhow, she told the doctor that she had told this to uh, her medical doctor. Now here's a thing that's a little bit sad and that is that many people would rather trust their medical doctor than their minister. Yeah, I hope the time will come when that isn't that way, but she did. But however, the dear doctor, he, he tried to comfort her the best that he could, but it wasn't too adequate. And so he just said to her, now look, I wouldn't worry about that if I were you. Uh, after all, that's not so bad. Nowadays, people think that there's nothing wrong in that. I mean, after all, you know, everybody, and it's perfectly all right to have a little affair like that. And uh, um, some people think it does you good, it gives you release, you know. So don't worry about it, if I were you. I don't worry about it at all. You're just no worse than anybody else. So don't worry about it at all. So she believed him. And she thought, oh, good. That's perfectly all right, that affair is. I don't have to worry about it. And now, you know, unfortunately, a great many people, both young and, and older, are taught this nowadays. And the whole matter is a little confusing. Because nowadays, you know, we have the pill and this and that. And the danger of having an illegitimate child is not so great. And um, so honestly, when young people say, well, what's wrong with it? Sometimes we Christian people instinctively feel that it's not the best thing we could do, but we don't quite know how to tell them. So I'll pass on to you something. And actually, I learned this from one of my young minister friends, John Sanford, as a matter of fact, not my son, the other one, Idaho John. And as soon as he said it, I thought, aha, that's it. That's the, that's the explanation. The explanation he gave was this, that the, the injury in an illegitimate affair is not to the physical body, but it is to the spiritual body. Or if you want to put it in other words, Jesus lives in you and he doesn't like it. <laughs> because a marital relation is given to us for the purpose of bringing forth children and also for the comfort and joy and satisfaction of those who are married. But the rest of the creative impulse and of what we call sex is only a part of the whole flow of creativity that goes through a person. Did you know that? Mm. The whole flow of creativity. And if a person is thinks they're very much in love, or perhaps they are very much in love, and they cannot, for one reason or another, marry this person, they don't have to spend the rest of their life in torment and travail. What they can do is offer this feeling to the Lord and ask him to sublimate it, lift it up, shift it up, turn it into some other form of creation. You know, like writing or painting or playing a good game of golf or uh, doing a small job of planting a garden. And wait a minute, it can be transferred. It can be lifted up and shifted from one channel to another channel. And when it is thus done, it not only relieves the person of this discomfort, but also it adds tremendously uh, to their creativity, whatever creative power God gave them. It adds to it. And this I know, of a certainty. Maybe that's why when David, you know, sinned with Bathsheba, and he repented of it, and he said so in the 51st Psalm, which we read every good day, uh, every lunch, you see, Ash Wednesday, I guess. And he said, Against thee, the only have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight. Well, he sinned against Bathsheba and against her poor husband whom he had shot in the war. But he felt that his greatest sin was against God because he had wasted an energy that God gave him for a higher purpose, you see? Well, so anyway, this is just to give you something to say when young people say, but what's wrong with it? Everybody does it. Not everybody does it. But I do believe it's swinging this way now. 
perhaps a reaction from the old stuffy days of Victorianism when we did go rather too far. I heard of one man who said he'd been married 20 years before he ever saw his wife's feet. <laughs> <laughs> that's true, that's true. <laughs> so perhaps we were a bit too stuffy and it's swinging over. But I do know for sure that it's going to swing back and re reach an equilibrium of common sense but real righteousness. Well, to get back to this lady, the psychiatrist very wisely caused her herself to say one day, she, he didn't tell her, she told him. Uh, you know, he knew how to do that. And so one day she said, you know, I've changed my mind about this affair I had. You know, I think it was wrong after all. And the psychiatrist said, I think you're very wise to come to that conclusion. Very wise. So she said, well, now what shall I do? So Dr. Stringham, having learned it from me, I'm afraid, in the school pastoral camp, said, now go and tell your minister, confess to him what you've done, and ask him to pray for your forgiveness, and you'll be all right. She came back the next day, a perfect wreck. Worse than ever. She said, he didn't do it. He didn't do it. I asked him to pray for my forgiveness, and he didn't do it. Now, I don't know what denomination he belonged to. If he'd have been a sacramental church, I'm sure he, he would have known that much to do it. But anyhow, he didn't do it. So the doctor said, well, uh, uh, well, well what, what did he do? <laughs> she said, oh, he just talked about like that other doctor. He just said, now, now, I wouldn't worry about that if I were you. Uh, God is very tolerant, and we all make mistakes from time to time, and I'm sure you're no worse than anybody else. And um, uh, just don't worry about it. Now, you know, the most, the weakest words in the language are, don't worry. <laughs> you know, when it's a thing, you shouldn't worry about it. So the doctor, bless his heart, the doctor said, well then, I'm sorry. The minister just did not know the power that is in, was in his hands. But he said, however, you and I will have to do it. He said, it says in the Bible, confess your sins one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. Notice the word healed. So they knelt on the office floor and the doctor thought, shall I lock my office door? And he decided, no, I won't lock my office door. Any Christian has a right to pray for any other Christian. So they knelt on the office floor, and he said to her, Now tell God what you did, and tell him you're sorry, and ask him, for Jesus' sake, to forgive you. Just something like that. So she did. Whereupon, all he did was to quote the scripture. Can't go wrong that way. And he said, Lord, this lady has now confessed before you and me, and so now I'm going to claim for her the promise of the scripture, which is, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, Lord, she has confessed. So, by faith, I say now that she is at this time being cleansed of all unrighteousness. And everything you knew that's not perfectly all right is being healed right now. So, thank you, Lord. She got up. She was well. She went home. She was perfectly well. She prayed himself right out of a whole lot of fees. <laughs> For which he gave thanks. <laughs> and she stayed well from then right on in. Now look, what's happened to us in this day and generation? Here was a lady who had suffered for four years. She had worked with a psychiatrist for goodness knows how long. And she still suffered. And one prayer of confession and accepting by faith, accepting forgiveness by faith, the whole thing I'm sure did not take five minutes and she was healed, perfectly healed. Well, that's the forgiveness of sins. Now, here is one thing that we have been taught, which I think has not been quite adequate. We have been taught, oh, just take it to the Lord in prayer, you see. And we have been, I know I was Presbyterian, this doctor was Presbyterian, you see. I was Presbyterian, too. And um, what we were taught was that you yourself must just take it to the Lord in prayer. They were never, never, never taught that there was any reason whatsoever to confess to anyone else. That was rags of popery, if you want to know. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, my friends, that's fine in many cases. That is what we always do. You people have been doing it here at the top of your lungs for days, and it's great. <laughs> but there are some circumstances in which it doesn't work. And don't blame yourself. It's not your fault. 
If you say, oh, Lord, forgive me, then the next thing you think, well, I asked him to forgive me a long time ago. Why hasn't he? You see. Well, he is, he has. The minute you asked him, he has. But the thing that has not been done is that your own subconscious, and I do know this much psychology, your own subconscious, your little mind inside, what the Bible calls the heart, has somehow not been able to accept the forgiveness. So that if you say to yourself, now I've got to believe it, I've got to believe it, thank you, Jesus, you have forgiven me. The little voice inside says, oh yeah. <laughs> and this is not our fault, really. This is the way we are made. In that when a, when a wound of any kind is very deep, it is sometimes almost impossible for the conscious mind to persuade the subconscious mind to accept the forgiveness. This is just a psychological fact. Now we can keep on trying and trying and trying and trying. But a much quicker way is if we can go to somebody, and the normal natural one to go to as a minister, but also I've had loads of people come to me, and I'm sure many of you have too, and ask them to pray for it. And one prayer, many a time, can open the way for an inrush of God's love, of the love of Jesus Christ and of his power, you see. Now, isn't this just wonderful to know? And now I'll tell you another way in which you can do this. And you have to vary this according to what church you belong to. But the most effective way that I've ever found to do this is through the church. I belong to the Episcopal Church. Well, I do it in two ways through the church, and one is that I have availed myself of the sacramental confession. Now, to some of you, this would seem very clear, and perhaps you can't because perhaps they just don't have it in your church, you see. And not even all Episcopal ministers, uh, some of them don't do it anymore. They've sort of lost faith in it. How perfectly strange. Because it's the most powerful thing the most powerful channel of prayer that I've ever come across. Ooh, brother, I'll never forget the time I made my first confession. I didn't want to, but somebody who was more sacramentally minded told me that here was something I was missing, and I should do it, you see. And the way I learn is, if a thing is not contrary to the Bible and not contrary to what Jesus said, then I'll try anything. If it is contrary, then it's out, you know. But if it's not contrary to what Jesus said, okay, I'll try it. So, I made a retreat in an Episcopal convent, and Sister Margaret instructed me, and she chose the priest to whom I should make a life confession, and I went and made a life confession with no more feeling of faith, of expectancy, or anything else than this wooden bench here. Not a single bit. I just thought, well, all right, I'll try anything once. They say do it, so, okay, you see. Well... I have never felt such waves of joy and love and relief. Absolutely tremendous. Now, this resource has been in the church from the very beginning, before there were any other denominations, when it was just one church. In the beginning, it was just called the Catholic Church. What happened? Why, it's gone out of style so. Even some Catholics, to my grief and distress, have lost faith in it now think they can do better by playing a guitar and singing little songs. What's happened? I don't know, really. But my guess would be that while they went through the form, maybe the faith in it disappeared. Because it isn't just the form that does this. It's Jesus that does this. The Lord who does this. And I don't care what form it comes back in. And I've known it to come back in all kinds of forms. Somebody kneeling beside a rocking chair in a little cabin in the woods with tears flying in every direction, you know. <laughs> and somebody else, man or woman, not necessarily a priest, but with enough gumption and enough love of Jesus to believe the thing is true, simply quoting the words of the Bible and saying, it's true, I accept it. Thank you, Lord. So, here is this tremendous thing. Now, however, that is one way, but not, as I say, available to everybody. And I, I hesitate even to suggest to you to, I wouldn't dare say, go and find a priest or a minister and ask him to do it, because if he, A, either refused to do it, which is quite possible, or B, felt, well, yes, this poor woman wants it, I guess it better go through the motions without believing it, the results could be disastrous. So I don't dare say. 
But here's another thing. Now, this I do dare say. I'll tell you one time. I thought I did one time. It took me about a year, over a year. I won't tell you so long. And this every one of you can do, adapting it a little bit maybe. I went to church every Sunday and received the communion. Now, if you don't have the communion in your church every Sunday, you can use the church service anyway and then take some of the prayers in there to apply to your case. But it's good to have a definite time, you see, to pin yourself down. And each year I went back in my memories one year, you see. And when I received the communion, I prayed for the life of Jesus Christ through the communion to come into that year of my life. And I prepared for it the day before by trying to remember, you see. Right when I reached the 40th year, while on Saturday, I'd say, Now, Lord, help me to remember. What happened around about my 40th year? What did I do that was wrong, or what happened that made me unhappy? Now, maybe I didn't hit it exactly, but that didn't matter, you know. I would take a little something. I would be able to remember something around about that time of my life that either caused me great grief or anger or feelings of guilt or something like that, you see. So when I received the communion, I would ask Jesus Christ to come into me and go back through time to the 40th year and find that young woman I was at the age of 40 and heal the memories of the wounds of the scars that happened during that year. You see, all of these grievous things that happen to us make, as it were, little paths through the gray matter of the brain. Harry Goldsmith, the you know, one I've talked so much about, calls them engrams, not that they have to have a name to make it true. But there they are. They're emotional thought patterns. And so that you don't know what happens. Some little thing happens that reminds your subconscious of something that happened when you were 40 years old, maybe. And it's just like pushing a button, and it connects a little train of emotional feelings. And you may not remember in the conscious mind what it is. You don't know what it is. But something gets next to you. You know, you get bold, cross, discouraged, something. Now listen, let me give you a bit of warning. Don't always just think, oh, it's the devil. If you do that, you're giving the devil power. You're just inviting him to come into you. If every time your mood changes, you think, oh, it's the devil, you're just opening the door for him. And besides, not the devil. It's just the fact to be the Holy Spirit of God moving inside of you, trying to get you to remember something so you confess it, can confess it and get out of your system. See there? And look, suppose there is a devil lurking around the corner. If you pray for Jesus to come into you, the devil's going to go away anyway. So I'd much rather pray for Jesus to come than for the devil to go, don't you think so? <laughs> Let him chase the devil. <laughs> but my main reason for saying this is many people miss a bit. They miss the chance of really getting redemption fully established in them because they fall back on the easy alibi of just saying, oh, it's the devil, you see. And what was I actually praying for? The body and blood of Christ. Well, the blood of Christ, you know what I was praying for. The blood of Jesus was actually shed on this earth and still remains in the air that surrounds this globe, as Star Daly said one time, ever increasing in a sort of a chain reaction, not as a red fluid, but as a spiritual energy given to us for the express purpose of forgiveness. And Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, that marvelous Roman Catholic Jesuit priest and anthropologist, said even more than that. He said, the blood of Christ shed upon this earth has penetrated every particle of this globe. Isn't that glorious? Isn't that gorgeous? And he's a scientist. So that this planet, so that Jesus not only was incarnated once through, the, through his birth through the Virgin Mary, but is forever incarnate in the little planet Earth. <coughs> So that's the energy you're calling on when you call on the blood of Christ. But what about the body of Christ? As we said last night, the body of Christ did not decay and die and remain on the set, but was resurrected and transformed at the same time into a different kind of a body. And you know, all of our Christian faith hinges on this. As concerns Jesus our Lord, one of two things had to be. Either that body decayed and the worms ate it, or it was resurrected cell by cell and transformed into a different kind of a body, one or the other. And St. Paul said, if we believe not that Christ rose again from the dead, then are we of all men most miserable, because we're founding our faith on the thing that we don't really think it's so. <laughs> so anyway, the body of Jesus did not remain on the earth. So when we say, this is my body, what are we praying for? Why are we praying for his spiritual body, the Holy Spirit to come in? Yes. That's what, that's what the communion is for. 
two currents, two currents. One current, the divine human Jesus from the planet Earth, wherein he is incarnated. The other kind, the human divine Jesus from the glory of the Father, wherein he now lives. Got back to the third year of my life. And I couldn't remember a thing about that, so I said, Lord, I don't know what happened in the third year of my life, but I ask you now to go back through time and find that little girl that was me from the age of three to the age of four and look and see anything that might have injured or affected the personality and heal it through your body and blood. And you know, the next week, I really did feel better. I mean, I felt physically better. I told you that I used to be a neurotic. And I really and truly uh, didn't feel that way anymore. And I wondered what in the world did happen when I was three years old. And I came across a little notebook in which my mother had kept the history of my life as a child. <coughs> and I looked it up. And sure enough, from the ages of three to four, uh, we were living in China, you see, and it seems I had, oh, I think four different children's diseases, one right after the other. I think it was measles and mumps and whooping cough and scarlet fever or something like that. And so I stayed right flat in the bed for three months. In those days when the doctor said, stay in bed, you stayed in bed. <laughs> and at the end of that time, my mother wrote, baby Agnes has decided that she does not want to be well, she wants to be sick. And when she wakes up in the morning, she says, Mother, I want to be sick. Please bring my breakfast upstairs. Oh. <laughs> right there was the beginning of a neurotic tendency. Now, from then on, breakfast in bed doesn't mean a thing to me, only crumbs in the sheets. <laughs> and that change took place. And it took place more than 50 years later through one prayer in the communion service. So then I went on back to the age of two, I went on back to the age of one, I went on back to the time of birth. You know, I've been told by psychiatrists and so on, something about the birth trauma, and I used to think that's silly. No, I don't think it's silly anymore. I think it can be very wounding and terrifying to the soul of the infant. And the mind can't remember it, but the soul somehow does remember. So I went back and prayed for the healing of the birth trauma, whatever it might be, and also for the healing of the soul of the infant even before birth. And all of that was through the communion service. And I never said a word about it to anybody at the time, and indeed not for years afterwards. You know, many of your spiritual experiments work better if you don't talk about them. Not for years afterwards. I guess the first one that I told about it was my son Jack, because he's pretty smart. So when he saw me about a uh, few months later, I was living in the East End, he said, Mom, what have you been doing? He said, there's something different. He said, why, you look to me like you've had a complete depth analysis. I said, I have. <laughs> so the communion service. So, all right. You see, there are ways. You can probably think of other ways. But there are ways. Now, you know, it's natural to think, well, if Jesus died for the forgiveness of our sins, then why doesn't he just do it? You know, why do we still crawl around here with all these troubles carrying all these burdens? Well, there are two parts to that. One part of it is we are part of the whole body of Christ. We do not live to ourselves alone. No man is an island. And part of the burden we carry is not really our own. Not really. It's the burden of the church and the burden of the world. I used to think that in a general confession, when we beat our breasts and moan that we are all men most miserable and miserable sinners and all, I used to think, well, I'm not. After all, I've been working on that for 50 years. Why have I got to say a miserable sinner? But then I got the explanation, actually, in that church um, that we went to in London. What was it? You didn't forget. Yes, they said Martin's in the fields, which is so funny because there's no field within 40 square miles. <laughs> it's right in the heart of London, but I guess in the beginning it was in a field. <laughs> and there they had a little printed thing in the pew, and they explained that prayer. And they said in a general confession, we were not confessing just our own sins. We were confessing the sins of the church through the centuries. Well, all right. You look back through the centuries, and you look at Christendom, and you remember gas chambers, and you remember inquisitions and whatnot. Plenty to confess, you see. It's not just all ours. So that's one reason why we carry these burdens. But the other reason is what I just said, in other words, and that is 
Although Jesus died in order to make this total freeing and complete forgiveness possible for us, nevertheless, he does not ram it down our throats. He does not do it automatically, because here is the other law, namely, that he's given us free will. We're free to accept him, we're free to reject him. So therefore, it's still here, it's still available, and you know, praise God, it's becoming more available all the time. I'm just absolutely amazed in California when I go to some of these Jesus people's meetings and hear these young ones just snatched out of the gutter by Jesus himself and I don't know who else. Uh, it's rather terrifying because they don't know anything and you don't know what kind of dangers they'll get into. But at the same time, it's marvelous. Here they are, filled with the love of Jesus, healed of drugs, healed of depression, transformed. Oh, he's doing, our Lord is coming nearer and nearer. His footsteps are shaking the earth right now. And it just remains for us to open our minds and open our souls and lift up our hearts to him. Open the door for him and he will come in. So thank you, Lord Jesus. Now here we are gathered together and we do open the doors for you, O Lord. And we've been opening the doors for the last three days. And Jesus, you know that we love you. We want to love you even more. And we want you to show us your love even more. And so right now, O oh Lord, come into us and go back through our memories. Forgive us, Lord Jesus. And help us to forgive, because you forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And yet, O oh Lord, even this we find rather difficult to do all by ourselves. Come into us now, therefore, O oh Lord, go back through the years. In every one of us, help us to remember whom we've been mad at. Who has hurt us the most? And tonight I'll pray just this much. Just that you will help us to remember to whom we owe forgiveness. And that you yourself, Lord Jesus, moving in us, will rush through us with a sweep of your love and go through us to this person, whether this person is in this life or in the next life. and change our feelings toward this one into feelings of love and understanding and gentleness and peace. Thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. I believe you are accomplishing this now. And perhaps tonight we will make wake up and remember somebody or something we've forgotten, and we may feel rather badly for a while, but let us rejoice and give thanks even so, because if so, you're bringing it out so that we will know how to forgive and whom to forgive. And perhaps on the other hand, you will reveal to us in a dream or even a bit of a vision on our bed at night something about the greatness and the power and the beauty of your forgiveness. So we thank you, Lord Jesus, believing this will be so. Amen.